Good morning, church family. <clears throat> Excuse me. Please turn with me in your copy of God's Word to the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24. It's page 985, if you're using your pew Bible, just a few pages back from where we just read in the Gospel of Mark. <clears throat> So, of course, we're continuing our ongoing study through Matthew's Gospel. More specifically, we're in the midst of uh, studying through what is known as the Olivet Discourse in chapter 24 and 25. This is the teaching that Jesus gave to His disciples there on the Mount of Olives, hence the name Olivet Discourse. And this was just a couple of days before His arrest and His crucifixion. I mentioned last week that this is a difficult passage and it has often been a controversial passage. It's a passage on which good and faithful Christians disagree. And this portion that we're going to examine this morning uh, may be even more contested and more disagreed upon than what we saw last week. So remember last week we talked about the two errors. The first error of full preterism. That's the claim that everything Jesus says here has already taken place in the past. But there's also the error of full futurism. The claim that everything Jesus says here is only referring to the distant future. And really, in many ways, this this view, this full futurist view, has become uh, very much the dominant view in much of American Uh, evangelicalism today as a biblical hermeneutic known as dispensationalism has become the uh, unconscious default belief of most of the American church. Now, if you ask your average Christian if they're a dispensationalist, most of them probably won't know what you're talking about. But this view has become imbibed into much of our, uh, uh, again, American evangelical consciousness, even if it doesn't have that name. And it's become that view through uh, massive cultural juggernauts like the Left Behind book series. That's one major example. <clears throat> Very influential teachers over the past 200 years like uh, Ryrie, Schofield, John Nelson Darby, and today with uh, good and godly men like David Jeremiah and John MacArthur and many others. So I say again, I must disagree with these good Christian teachers, but I do so in the spirit of respect and humility and charity, uh, Christian brotherhood, and of course ultimately allegiance to the Word of God, as I know theirs is as well. So I believe the primary error of full futurism lies in making essentially the same mistake that the disciples made when they asked Jesus their question in verse 3. We're going to look at that in just a moment. Remember, we talked about this last week. They assumed that all these things that they were asking Jesus, well, this, all these things have to take place at the same time. There's no other way it could happen. But we also saw last week how Jesus showed that their one question actually had two answers. The destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, well, those things would take place within that generation, within 40 years of Jesus giving this teaching. And that event would mark the end of the age, the end of the Old Covenant age, which was defined by and centered around the temple and the sacrifices that were offered there. But Jesus is also pointing out that as cataclysmic and uh, seemingly end-of-the-world-ish as those events themselves would be, they would not yet mark the end of the world. That final and glorious coming of the Son of Man to consummate all of history. That was the disciples' error, and really I believe the full futurists are making the same error just in the other direction. They say that everything Jesus says here, it has to take place at the same time. And clearly, not all these things took place in A.D. 70. Therefore, everything here must be referring to the future when Jesus comes again at the end of the world. So what we have to keep in mind here, beloved, in all this chapter and really all of Scripture, is if we make either one of these errors, we're going to be confused. We're going to be uh, susceptible to manipulation by bad actors. We're going to be prone to fear. And we're going to be tempted to inaction in action in our world. But when we really understand, what I, I believe when we understand this text, when we recognize what Jesus has already accomplished, when we realize where we are today in the timeline of redemptive history, then we're free. We're free to live from fear. 
We're confident, not in ourselves, but in Christ. Then we're enabled and equipped to engage the lost world around us with the gospel of the kingdom of God to proclaim to the lost of both Jew and Gentile alike what King Jesus has already done and then what he will come again one day to do in the future. So let's read. Let's pick up uh, uh, back in verse 3. So we're going to read much of the passage we read last week to give us a little bit of context. We'll begin in verse 3 and read all the way through verse 28. The Apostle Matthew, under the inspiration of God the Holy Spirit, writes these words. As Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, <clears throat> excuse me, famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Excuse me. <clears throat> Verse 15. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant, and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Let's pray. Holy and gracious God, may your Holy Spirit give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that with the eyes of our hearts enlightened, we may know the hope to which Christ has called us, the riches of his glorious inheritance among us, and the greatness of his power for all who believe. Amen. So I don't like to go into details on on Greek terms and such too much in my sermons, but there is a very important Greek word here in this passage that we have to take a look at. This key word we have to understand here is the Greek word parousia. Parousia. P-A-R-O-U-S-I-A. Parousia. And some of you may have heard that word before. Parousia, in its most basic sense, it means coming or it means presence. But here in Scripture, it has a very specific connotation. In Scripture, it's always used to refer to the physical, bodily return of Jesus Christ at the end of time to judge the world. And it's used four times here in Matthew chapter 24 alone. It's used twice in the final section, which we're going to look at in a few weeks. Um, That's when Jesus switches to talk about his second coming, of which he knew neither the day nor the hour at that point. It's used once in verse 27. We'll look at that in just a bit. But it's first used in Matthew 24 all the way back in verse 3 when the disciples ask him their original question. And so Jesus' two answers to their question make it very clear that he's drawing a sharp distinction between these two events because they're marked by two different Greek words. First, he's talking about the end of the age. The Greek word there is syntelea. 
Don't worry too much about that one. Sintaleia is the end of the age. And later, beginning in verse 36, he's going to specifically talk about the parousia, his bodily second coming. And so all that we've read so far, he's not talking about the parousia yet. He's not talking about his second coming. He's still talking about the other one, the Sintaleia, the end of the old covenant age. And so in order to help us dispel some of the confusion and some of the misunderstandings, common misunderstandings around this text this morning, I want to highlight four ways from these verses, verses 15 through 28, verse four ways that we can be sure and confident that Jesus is primarily talking about the events of the year A.D. 70. Four ways that we can be confident in Christ, confident in what He did in the past, and so hopefully, God willing, we can help to be freed from all this complication and all the confusion that marks so much of American evangelicalism today. So first, we have the final sign of prophecy fulfilled. The final sign of prophecy fulfilled. Verse 15. Remember, Jesus has just gotten done listing all these signs of the end of the age. And then verse 15. So, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Now, there's a lot going on in just that verse. You could write entire books on what's going on in this verse. So let's start with the end of the verse. What is that little, uh, in my Bible it's in parentheses. Maybe it is in yours as well. Let the reader understand. Now, some of you may have red-letter Bibles, which put the uh, apparent words of Jesus in red, and that phrase in red-letter Bibles is almost always in red, indicating that Jesus spoke this phrase here. He certainly may have. It's certainly possible. But if Jesus said this, why would He have called His listeners readers? He was sitting on the top of the Mount of Olives talking to His disciples, and if He just all of a sudden turned off to face an invisible TV camera like Jim on The Office or something and said, let the reader understand, that would have made no sense. Many times in His earthly ministry, He said things like, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. But He didn't say that here. And so full futurists will claim that this is Jesus speaking down through the corridors of time, speaking to us directly, us to us today, almost 2,000 years later. Again, yes, that's certainly possible. But to paraphrase Captain Jack Sparrow, I think it's highly improbable. I think it's far more likely that this is an editorial note from the pen of Matthew as he wrote under the inspiration of God the Holy Spirit. He's writing and recording the words of Jesus about 30 years later, and he's encouraging his audience, who you remember are Jewish Christians, he's encouraging them to recognize and understand what Jesus spoke at that moment 30 years prior. Just for the record, I'm personally not a big fan of red-letter Bibles. Nothing wrong with them, but that's just one reason why. So then what did Jesus, we have to ask, what did Jesus expect his original listeners to understand? And what did Matthew expect his original readers to understand? And then what do we need to understand today? Well, we have to recognize that every single Jewish person in the generation, in the generation of Jesus and also of Matthew, they would have instantly recognized that phrase, the abomination of desolation they would have instantly recognized that as being a reference to the prophet Daniel, specifically Daniel's famous prophecy of weeks from Daniel chapter 9. You don't have to turn there. I want to turn there and read this, these few verses for you to get it in your minds. Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. It says this, Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for sixty-two weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. Excuse me. And after the sixty-two weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed, 
He shall make a strong covenant with many for one week, and for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall come the one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. Now that's one of the most complicated and controversial passages in all of the Old Testament. <clears throat> And that's another text that full futurists will take as referring explicitly to the end of days, specifically to the Antichrist, who they say will rule the world and be worshipped instead of God from the rebuilt third temple in Jerusalem. The problem is, beloved, that there not only is there not one figure called the Antichrist in Scripture, except for 1 John 3, but if, there is, if that is referring to only one person, then it happened uh, in the first century. But in Scripture, no Christian reader in the history of the church, in the history of the last 2,000 years, would have ever thought to understand Jesus' words in Matthew 24 or the words of Daniel here in 9. Nobody would ever have thought to interpret those words to referring to the end of days until about 200 years ago. But every first century Jewish person knew this reference well because they believed that that prophecy had already been fulfilled in the past. Now, how did they believe that? Why did they believe that? The last few chapters of, of the book of Daniel include these uh, 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 prophecies about a figure called the King of the North who will invade Jerusalem and stop the regular sacrifices in the rebuilt temple even after they came back from exile. And this actually happened already in Jesus' time. It's not recorded for us in the pages of Scripture, but in the year 167 B.C., so we call that the intertestamental period, the 400 years between Malachi and Matthew, as it were, John the Baptist. 167 B.C., the ruler Antiochus IV Epiphanes from the Ptolemy or the Seleucid dynasty invaded Jerusalem. He invaded the temple. He stopped the sacrifices. And he even set up a pagan altar for pagan sacrifices directly on top of the Jewish altar of burnt offerings there in the temple itself. And he went in even so, a step further and he slaughtered a pig, the ultimate unclean animal. He slaughtered a pig on that pagan altar in the temple and then forced the priest to eat it. <clears throat> That was the original abomination of desolation. This is recorded, though, in the historical books of the Maccabees, and this event eventually led to the Maccabean Revolt, and that's also the origin of the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah, which Jesus himself actually observed in John chapter 10. But ever since that time, because of Hanukkah, it was remembered, it was memorialized, the Jewish people had recognized that the abomination of desolation, that prophecy from Daniel 9, was fulfilled by Antiochus IV Epiphanes desecrating the temple. But here, in about 30 AD, Jesus says, oh, this is fulfillment is still yet to come. It's still in the future for him and for those people in that day. And so, in the same way, remember, so many biblical prophecies have both near-term and far-term fulfillments. So, too, this famous prophecy from Daniel chapter 9, it was first fulfilled in 167 B.C., yes, but at that point, its greater fulfillment was still yet to come. The desecration by Antiochus Epiphanes was still a type or a shadow of the greater desecration that was yet to come. A good point to keep in mind, beloved, that the ultimate fulfillment of so much biblical prophecy is not necessarily chronological, but Christological. Okay? Keep that in mind. So then, what event was Jesus prophesying about here in the Olivet Discourse? Well, some scholars say that he's referring to when the temple was again uh, desecrated and then destroyed, of course, by the Romans under General Titus in A.D. 70, as their invasion and destruction of the city culminated in Titus ev uh, invading the Temple Mount itself. But, of course, that event itself would then be too late for the people to see it and have time to flee. <clears throat> oh, some say, excuse me, <coughs> One more. It's fun that keeps popping up. <clears throat> 
So some say that that's talking about uh, Titus invading the the Jerusalem and the temple. Some say that it's referring to the period of about a year and a half or so leading up to that event because in the year 68, Emperor Nero committed suicide and Rome was thrown into a brief civil war as different people vied for control. General Vespasian, Titus' father, returned to Rome and eventually emerged victorious as the next Caesar. And during that Roman civil war, Jewish zealots that militaristic, nationalistic sect in Jerusalem, they tried to take advantage of Rome's temporary chaos. They tried to take over Jerusalem, but all they ended up doing is throwing Jerusalem itself into a kind of civil war. And that civil war culminated with the Jewish zealots slaughtering over 8,500 people in the temple. That makes a bit more sense, I think, but it's probably still a bit too early on the timeline to justify fleeing to the hills. <coughs> I think the best understanding comes from Scripture itself. In Luke's account of this teaching from Jesus, Luke 21, verse 20, he says, When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, know that its desolation is near. So in other words, even if the people missed all these other signs, the signs of the end of the age, the false prophets, the wars, rumors of wars, famines, earthquakes, the final sign they were to heed and was, uh, was the armies of Rome marching over the hills, coming into the valley to surround Jerusalem. So then what should the reader understand back in Matthew 24? We as readers today ought to understand exactly what the readers in Matthew's day ought to have understood. This prophecy from Daniel ultimately finds its fulfillment in Christ. He is the one who put an end to sin. He atoned for iniquity. He brought in everlasting righteousness. He himself is the anointed most holy place. He is the one who decreed desolations upon his false people, his faithless nation. He is the one who brought in the great Roman army as the wing of abominations and the one who makes desolate. And he is the one who will pour out the decreed end on the desolator. Titus is gone. Rome is no more. And one day Satan will be cast into the eternal fire forever. So we have the final sign of prophecy fulfilled. Second, we have the specific location of the great tribulation. <clears throat> the specific location of the great tribulation. Verse 16. So when you see these things happen, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in the house. Let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. Alas, for women who are pregnant or nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. These words here from Jesus cannot possibly refer to a future global tribulation, quote unquote. If this is talking about a global tribulation, then where would his people flee to? This is another reason why full futurists insist on a reconstructed third temple. See, they say, since Jesus is clearly speaking to us, to the people of the future, there has to be a third temple, which will then be desecrated by the Antichrist, and so then the Jewish believers in Judea will know to flee to the hills. Again, beloved, a reconstructed third temple itself would be a, the ultimate desecration of Christ's finished work on behalf of his people. And so I think you have to employ some pretty extreme uh, hermeneutical and linguistic gymnastics to arrive at that conclusion. Because a far more simple and straightforward, and I believe biblically consistent, uh, a historically accurate understanding of what Jesus was giving his, is, that, is that Jesus is giving his people signs and warnings of the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. And he was telling them not to do what their natural instincts would prompt them to do. Because when you see an army coming over the hill in those days and you're working out in the fields, where do you run to? The city. The place with lots of people. The place with big, thick, massive stone walls. The place where an army is garrisoned. That should be the place of safety. That should be the place of refuge from these marauding invaders. But Jesus says, that's going to be your instinct, but don't do it. The city will not be a place of safety for you. The city will instead be the place of destruction and suffering. So when you see the Roman armies coming up over the hills, they're run to the hills, run into the mountains, flee. Don't even bother to go inside and get your things. And since up until that point, life's going to be going on just as as normal, it'll be especially difficult for women who are pregnant 
women who are nursing mothers, it'll be even worse if it happens in winter or on the Sabbath because the season or the weather or the Sabbath restrictions will make travel and escape logically, logistically much more difficult. So these are Jesus' words of warning to his people in the region of Judea around Jerusalem in and up to the year A.D. 70. I also mentioned that we call this the Great Tribulation. Now you may have heard that term before as well. You may associate that term in your mind with a future worldwide event, a global persecution of Christians. That may certainly happen, beloved. But it's not the focus of Jesus' words here. And that's not how the Bible uses that term. Again, I believe you have to use a lot of futurist assumptions and presuppositions to come to that conclusion. This may happen. There may be a global persecution before the parousia, before Jesus' bodily return. But that's not what he's talking about here. And so in this passage, and parenthetically I believe also in the book of Revelation, The Great Tribulation refers to the period leading up to the year A.D. 70, beginning with the persecution under Nero about three and a half years prior to this and culminating then in the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem. So let's see what Jesus says. Verse 21, For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no and never will be. And again, futurists claim that this verse proves, quote-unquote, that Jesus is still talking about his future second coming, the parousia. Well, the tribulation in A.D. 70, yes, that was certainly bad, but it's not the worst that ever will be. Therefore, Matthew 24 can't be talking about A.D. 70. But is that what Jesus is saying here? I don't believe so. Remember, Jesus is speaking in prophecy. He's speaking in his his typical biblical prophetic fashion. And his words here, his language, is an example of biblical prophetic language. It uses what the, the scholars call Semitic hyperbole. It's an exaggerated and heightened form of speech that was very common to the Jewish people. And they would have recognized it as speaking prophetically. It impresses upon the listeners and readers the gravity of the situation. And there's examples of this all throughout Scripture. Exodus chapter 11 says, There shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there never has been nor ever will be again. Now, I assume Egypt is considered part of the globe. So that can't be talking about the parousia as well. Or Ezekiel 5.9, And because all of your abominations, I will do with you what I have never yet done, and the like of which I will never do again. That's God talking about the destruction of the first temple. But clearly he did something like that again when he destroyed the second temple in AD 70. Or Daniel 12.1, <clears throat> There shall be a time of trouble such as never been seen since there was a nation until that time. Or Joel 2.2, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness there is spread upon the mountains a great and powerful people. Their like has never been before nor will be again after them through the years of all generations. All these passages that I just referenced have different applications, different audiences, different recipients, different circumstances. And the point is that this is commonly used prophetic, hyperbolic language that Jesus' Jewish listeners and Matthew's Jewish Christian readers would have immediately recognized as such. And so he's not necessarily saying, literally, this is referring to the final cataclysmic event, which will be the uh, greatest violence the world has ever seen. No, he's using this heightened language to impress upon them the devastation and the significance of what is about to come. And speaking of the significance, because the original audience was Jewish, they also would have grasped the massiveness, the enormity of the significance of the destruction of the temple. The historian Josephus records that 1.1 million Jews were slaughtered during the siege of Jerusalem. And some think that might seem a, a, a high number at first, but remember that not all the people in the countryside around Jerusalem heard Jesus' warning or heeded Jesus' warning to not flee to the city. And so as the Roman army advanced, refugees came pouring into Jerusalem from miles and miles around as the Roman army advanced and they destroyed cities and farms and towns all across Galilee and Samaria and Judea. One commentator remarked that throughout the whole history of the human race, 
we meet with few, if any, instances of slaughter and devastation at all to be compared with this. Rome's persecution of the Jewish people in the years from 66 to 70. But even as terrible as the loss of human life and the destruction of the holy city were on a a grander scale, on a more cosmic scale, if you will, the Jewish people lamented the destruction of God's holy temple. A theologian, Ken Gentry, puts it this way. He says, The covenantal significance of the loss of the temple stands as the most dramatic outcome of the Jewish war. For a thousand years since the time of Solomon, Israel's worship had centered upon her temple. And for 2,000 years since the time of Abraham, the Jews had worshipped God through animal sacrifices. All this is now over. After seeing the temple site shortly after its destruction, a rabbi simply named Rabbi Joshua, he lamented, Woe unto us that this, the place where the iniquities of Israel were atoned for, is laid waste. But of course, was that really the place where their iniquities were atoned for? No. The real place where the iniquities of Israel and all mankind were atoned for was on a cross outside the city. But any Jewish calamity after A.D. 70, Gentry says, any Jewish calamity after A.D. 70 pales in comparison to the redemptive historical significance of the loss of the temple. It's almost impossible to underestimate the significance of this event. And Josephus himself described those events of A.D. 70 in ways that sound remarkably similar to the words of Jesus himself. Josephus said, The war which the Jews made with the Romans has been the greatest of all, not only in our times, but of those that were ever heard of. The misfortunes of all men from the beginning of the world, if they be compared to these of the Jews, are not as considerable as they were. Neither did any other city ever suffer such miseries from the beginning of the world. Now, Josephus, of course, was a Jew, so it's understandable that he would use that same kind of Jewish prophetic language to describe the significance of what happened. <clears throat> Finally, Richard Lenski, I, use, I quote Richard Lenski very often. He's a, he's a Lutheran scholar and commentator. He described God's judgment on Jerusalem this way. He said, the reason for all this is the terrible state of the nation of Israel when the Roman War began. No nation had ever piled up a guilt such as that of the Jews who were chosen of God, infinitely blessed, and yet crucified God's Son and trampled upon all His further grace. No judgment had ever or can ever be so severe. In the history of the world, no judgment can be compared with this that wiped out the Jews as a nation. Well, then further, Jesus Himself goes on to say, verse 22, And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Again, this can't be referring to a global event at the end of time. The siege of Jerusalem was horrific. Murder, cannibalism. But it ended after five months. It ended after Rome finally broke through the wall and they slaughtered uh, uh, 1.1 inhabitants, uh, 1.1 million inhabitants of the city and finally destroyed the temple complex. And that shortness... That relative shortness of that siege, it was actually a mercy to the true people of God. It was a mercy to the the Jewish people, whether they were God's people or not, because it allowed them to not be wiped out, and God has still preserved them in some way, shape, or form down to this day. But it was specifically a mercy to the true people of God, the elect, who were there among the false people. Much like Lot being saved from Sodom and Gomorrah. So Jesus Christ brought judgment in AD 70 on his false people, but in his mercy, he cut the time short. He preserved the elect. He preserved his true people from among the Jewish uh, nation so that his true people, the elect from among the Jews, they would not be completely wiped out, but rather they would be preserved as a remnant. And again, he has still preserved a remnant of ethnic Jewish people who are among his true people, the elect of Jesus Christ to this day and age. Praise the Lord. So he preserved his people in and through the great tribulation. So third, we see the false advents of false Christs. The false advents of false Christ. Of course, advent means coming. We use it to refer to Christmas time when Jesus came the first time. We also refer to his second advent when he will come again in the future. 
but we're talking about false advents or false comings of false Christs. So last, in last week's passage, Jesus first mentioned the false prophets and false Christs, and here he gives his listeners and Matthew's readers further warnings about them. Verse 23, Then if anyone says to you, <clears throat> Look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Now again, Full futurists will say that in the last days there will be false prophets and false Christ performing signs and wonders that will deceive even people who claim to be Christians. And really, we've seen all those things ever since uh, uh, for the last 2,000 years. As, uh, how many faith healers out there today that are lengthening legs and arms that are just charlatans? <clears throat> But in the years leading up to AD 70, in Judea specifically, there was a remarkable, renewed messianic fervor. There was a, a shocking proliferation of people who were claiming to be the true Messiah. People saying things like, Jesus, that guy was a fraud. He claimed to be the Messiah, but clearly we're still under the boot of Rome, so I'm here to do what he failed to do. I'm here to set us free. And history records, in the years between A.D. 30 and A.D. 70, here's just a, a partial list, a partial list of some men who claim to be the true Christ, the true Messiah. Decithius the Samaritan, Simon Magus, Justus bar Ezekius, Simon of Perea, Athrongus, Judas of Galilee, Theudas, the Egyptian false prophet, a man simply known as the imposter, Menemos, Simon Barjora, John of Giscala, the Samaritan Messiah, Jonathan the Weaver, and a false prophet in Jerusalem who prophesied God's salvation even after the year A.D. 70. And then, of course, there was Simon Bar Kokhba. Some of you historians will know what the Bar Kokhba rebellion was. In A.D. 132, whose followers claimed he was the Messiah, and his messianic, quote-unquote, rebellion resulted in the final destruction of Jerusalem by Rome. And so Jesus says that these false Christs will even go so far as to apparently perform great signs and wonders. Now all throughout Matthew's Gospel, Jesus' miracles were validation of His divine identity and His authority. But whatever these signs and wonders these false Christs will perform, they will be false. They'll be fakes. Think of Moses when he was confronting Pharaoh. Pharaoh's court magicians tried to perform miracles, and the little things they could do were pathetically small, pathetically weak and impotent compared to the true power of the true God of the universe. And so in the same way, these false Christs, they may be engaging in trickery, sleight of hand. They may, they, they may have some form of apparently supernatural power. But the elect the true people of Jesus Christ will not be deceived. And so Jesus warns then about falling for them, falling for these false Christ. Verse 25, he says, See, I have told you beforehand. I'm giving you a heads up that this is going to happen. So if they say to you, Look, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, Look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. It was common in those days for these false Christs, these false messiahs, to call their followers out into the wilderness. Uh, I think of John the Baptist. That was the, the sign of spirituality, was going out into the wilderness. And they could also teach them in private. Uh, but also they would, they would take them into the inner room to impart some kind of secret teaching, some kind of secret knowledge. Jesus says, don't fall for it. Be on your guard. Learn to discern. The true people of Jesus Christ, after the day of Pentecost, will have the Holy Spirit within, will be given the ability to stand firm even amidst the false advent of false Christs. <clears throat> and then fourth and finally, the unmistakable nature of the true parousia. I'm going to make you write that word. The unmistakable nature of the true parousia. P-A-R-O-U-S-I-A. Verse 27, For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. In stark contrast to the secretive nature of these false Christs and their puny little fake miracles, the true coming of the true Christ will be clear. It will be obvious. It will be unmistakable. It will be for all the world to see. These false Christs and false prophets that are pop pop popping up everywhere, 
not only are they not the true second coming of the true Christ, they're still only a sign of the end of the age. The Sintaleia that Jesus first mentioned back in verse 5 and in response to the disciples' question in verse 3. And again, we're going to talk more about this in a couple of weeks when we come back to Matthew 24. But in answering the disciples' original question there in verse 3, Jesus says that these signs will, the signs that will be given, everything He's been talking about so far, everything He's been warning His followers to watch for, all these things will mark the Sintaleia, the end of the age. But the parousia, His bodily second coming, it will have no such warning signs. It will not be secretive. It will be unmistakable and unmissable to the entire world. And so finally then, Jesus gives this somewhat cryptic word in verse 28. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Now this is a difficult saying. Uh, Vultures, of course, tend to circle around dead bodies. Vultures seem to have a knack for knowing uh, when and where dead flesh can be found. And they were often seen circling around armies as they marched and assembled on the battlefield. And so Jesus seems to be saying this here in relation to observing these signs of the end of the age. Now, it can be kind of confusing because over in Luke chapter 17, he says much the same thing. And seemingly, he says that in relation to the parousia. So what do we do with this? Some people have suggested that this is an image of the corpse of Jerusalem being surrounded by the vultures of the Roman army, who you remember carried flags and standards with the eagle on top. I don't think that's necessarily what Jesus means here. This is a proverb of sorts. It's very similar to a line in Job, Job 39.30. I think when Jesus says it in Luke, he intends it in a different application than when he says it here. And so I think the, probably the best explanation, again, comes from Richard Lenski, who I quoted earlier. I think Lenski gives the best explanation of why in Matthew, Jesus says this proverb here in relation to his warnings about false prophets and false Christs. Lenski says this, Who acts like vultures that pounce on carrion to fatten upon the reeking flesh? Lenski had a gift for a turn of phrase. But who acts like vultures, in other words? He says, why these false Christs and these false prophets? They seek to get a personal advantage from the dead and decaying body of their nation. And so Jesus says to his disciples, when you hear these cries to come here or there in connection with false Christ and false prophets, remember that Christ comes in glory that is instant and visible to the whole world. And that you have in those raucous cries of the false Christ only a case of vultures going to feast on carrion. But Jesus indicates the hopeless state of the Jewish nation. Carrion is death come into putrefaction. It is fit only for vultures. When the Jewish nation is so far gone, it is fit for nothing but false Christs and false prophets who are to finish the horrible job of removing that nation from existence. And that comports with Jesus' words of judgment at the end of chapter 23, right? In other words, Jesus is telling His people to read the signs of the times. Beware the false Christ. Don't follow them because they're false. They're only there to pick the dead bones clean. When the true Christ comes again, the entire world will see Him and the entire world will acknowledge that Jesus is the true Messiah. The unmistakable nature of the true parousia. So then, what for us today? We've seen how Jesus' words here are referring to the terrible events of A.D. 70. So if that was spoken and it was written for His people in the first century, what does it have to do with us today? What do we today do with these words from our Lord? Well, first of all, stop worrying so much about the future. (laughs) It's in His hands. The future is in His hands. And guess what, beloved? If you're in Christ, then so are you. So stop worrying about what a bunch of God-hating, anti-Christ people and uh, anti-Christ nations in the Middle East are doing. And instead, fix your eyes, fix your minds, fix your heart on Jesus. The focus, the hero, the central figure of the Bible is not the nation of ethnic Israel, but it's Jesus. And so the more your heart and your mind is conformed to His, the more you can rest in 
in His finished work, the more you can be confident in your eternal destiny, not because of what you or I have done or deserve, but because of what Jesus has done and what He does deserve. And the more you'll be enabled to be calm and steady in the face of turbulent, ever-changing world events the more steadfastly you'll be able to live as the disciple of Jesus Christ in the midst of a world that hates Him and hates His followers. The more steady and ably you'll be able to lead others to Christ, God willing. The more clearly and confidently, God willing, you will be able to proclaim the unchanging and certain hope of the gospel of the kingdom to other people. And second, take comfort in what Christ has already accomplished in history. He destroyed the temple. He poured out His wrath and holy justice against His false people, the ones who crucified Him and were unrepentant. He ended those types and those shadows of the old covenant age once and for all. He fulfilled all of God's covenantal promises. He ushered in the light of the new covenant age. He secured all of God's covenantal blessings for all of God's true people. He preserved His true people through the great tribulation. He cut short their suffering so as to preserve Himself a remnant of true believers who are Jews both according to the flesh and according to the Spirit. And He did all of this because of what He accomplished when He was here the first time. He came as an infant, God and man together in one person. He fulfilled, he obeyed God the Father perfectly in every way. He fulfilled the law and the prophets. He willingly laid down his life as the perfect atonement, the covering for sin, the perfect once for all sacrifice for all of his people, past, present, and future. He was crucified, died, and was buried. As we confess every week, on the third day, he rose again in victory over sin and death and Satan. He rose again as proof that the Father. Father had indeed accepted His perfect sacrifice on our behalf. On behalf of all who are His people from every nation by grace through faith. He ascended into heaven. He took His seat at the right hand of the Father. That seat that is the seat of all power and authority in heaven and on earth. The day of Pentecost, He sent the Holy Spirit into the hearts of all believers. And so now there's no longer any need of a physical temple. There's no need of priests. There's no need of sacrifices because now... He is the temple. He is in heaven. And so now men and women from every tribe and nation and tongue can come to Him in repentance and faith without having to go to Jerusalem, without having to go to a priest, without having to go to a physical temple. And all who come to Him can and will receive His life and receive His grace and His forgiveness and His mercy simply by coming to Him. So this is what Christ has already accomplished in history, beloved. Take comfort in these things. And finally, take comfort in what Christ will certainly do in the future for His people. He will certainly accept all who come to Him. He said, all who come to, him, all who come to Me, I will in no wise cast out. He will certainly give to them His forgiveness and love and mercy. He will certainly give them His Holy Spirit within. He will certainly conform all of us into His image and likeness. He will certainly build all of us up together into His church. His temple of sorts. His presence here on earth. He will certainly build His church so that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He will certainly preserve His true people for all eternity, even if as a remnant in this life even if more tribulation does come. He will certainly destroy the world system of sin and death and Satan once and for all. <clears throat> and He will certainly come again. Physically, bodily, gloriously, for all the world to see. He will certainly judge the wicked. He will certainly destroy His enemies forever. He will certainly usher in the new heavens and the new earth. He will certainly reign from the midst of His people, the new Jerusalem, the city not made by human hands, His glorious church. He will certainly consummate the marriage of the Lamb to His bride. And He will certainly give to all of His true people from every nation the eternal blessing of His unveiled presence forever. That's our hope. That's our confidence. Because the great tribulation is completed. The temple is destroyed. Jesus is the new temple. Jesus is the true and better Israel. Jesus is the new covenant. To God be the glory. Great things He hath done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son, who yielded His life and atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.
Even so come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, forgive us for not knowing your word as we ought. Forgive us for our ignorance. Forgive us for our boredom and our complacency. So give us a fresh passion to know you and to know your plan for your people as you have revealed to us in your word. And by your great and mighty hand, you have displayed this in history. May we all be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. May we be firmly rooted and grounded on the unchanging foundation of Jesus Christ, his finished work on behalf of all of his true people. May we not fear for the future, but may we rest in joyful confidence of what Christ has done and what he will come again to do. Help us to fix our eyes on him, the author and finisher of our faith. Conform our hearts and our minds more and more into his image and his likeness. Keep us on the straight and narrow path of following Christ through every trial and tribulation that may come our way, even if we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And we can do this because we are secure in the confidence that Jesus Christ is the temple. He is the sacrifice. He is the covenant. He is the ultimate prophet, priest, and king, and that one day he will come again to claim his kingdom, defeat his enemies, and reward his people. On that day, when the trumpet sounds, may we be found in him. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for the sake of his glorious kingdom. Amen.